Don't bring a gun to a sword fight. Am I crazy? Am I kidding? <laughs> well, I may be crazy, but I'm not kidding. We recently published a video called The Five Fastest Ways to Get Killed in a Sword Fight. We got a lot of great comments on it. We also got a handful of comments like this one. The biggest mistake you can make is to come to a sword fight without a gun. And this one. The first mistake is not bringing a gun to a sword fight. And this one. How to avoid being killed in a sword fight, Smith and Wesson. <laughs> I suspect those folks may have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark one too many times. But underlying those bring a gun comments are four very common, very serious mistakes. Misunderstanding strategy, underestimating the opponent, underestimating the effect of fear, and misunderstanding the relationship between the warrior and the weapon. God made men big and God made men small. Then along came Smith and Wesson and equalized them all. Burma shave. What is it that makes a pistol or any weapon an equalizer? Equal to what exactly? I submit that the weapon makes the shorter fighter equal to the longer fighter. And it makes the weaker fighter equal to the stronger fighter. The strategic question is, how far can you reach and how much damage can you do from there? Well, what you have to understand is this. None of the four strategic positions is any better than any of the others. The longer, stronger position isn't a guaranteed winner. It isn't an inherently superior position. Any decent poker player will tell you any hand can be a winner and any hand can be a loser. It all depends on how you play your cards. The longer, stronger fighter has an advantage if and only if he executes that strategy better than his shorter, weaker opponent executes that strategy. Let's take the case of David v. Goliath. Now going into the fight, Goliath was in the longer, stronger position. He was used to being in that position, and he was pretty damn good at it. If David had stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Goliath, Goliath would have turned David into a little bitty grease spot. But when David took up that sling, he became the longer, stronger fighter. Goliath now found himself in the shorter, weaker position, and he had no idea how to use that strategy effectively. He could have ducked. He could have blocked David's stone with his shield. He could have used his sword to swat away David's stone like Ty Cobb. He could have covered up and zigzagged in, making himself hard to hit until he was close enough to use that sword. He could have charged in while David was reloading, looking for another rock. But Goliath didn't do any of those things. David didn't win the battle because he was in the longer, stronger position. Goliath lost the battle because he didn't know how to use the shorter, weaker position. And just like that sling, a gun gives you an advantage over a sword if and only if you use your gun better than your opponent uses his sword. This brings us to the error of underestimating the opponent, along with its Siamese twin overestimating yourself. And this is always, always the worst mistake you can make. So yeah, if the swordsman stands out in the open 30 feet away and juggles his sword and quacks like a duck for you, it may be possible for you to shoot him. But I think it's inadvisable to assume that your performance will always be perfect and all your opponents will be idiots. So what if he doesn't just stand there? 
There was a cop named Tuller from Salt Lake City. He figured out that an assailant armed with a knife could cover a distance of 21 feet in about 1.5 seconds, faster than the average officer could draw a holstered firearm and fire two accurate shots center mass. I once participated in a Tuller drill as part of a class. I think it was a class of maybe 10 or 15 people. And, and all but one failed to get a shot off before being stabbed by the assailant. And the one exception didn't succeed because he was faster than the assailant, but only because he was, um, let's say, thinking outside the box. And in the real non-movie world, relatively few assailants will draw a knife or a sword and show it to you and say, here I come, ready, set, go. Let me tell you about a pistol class I took. The instructor was a competitive shooter, a triathlete, and a gun collector. So in addition to the little 22 caliber target pistols we had, we, we shot a bunch of different weapons from his private stash. Uh, we shot a Colt 1911, like the one I used in the service. Um, fired an antique Colt cavalry revolver with a, with a seven and a half inch barrel. Uh, heavy as a horse and kicked like one too. We fired a, um, a black powder uh, dueling pistol, a flintlock. We fired from the triangle stance, from the weaver stance, fired one-handed. I tried shooting from the hip. <laughs> That was funny. Um, the target was maybe about the size of a dinner plate. I don't recall the exact distance, but it uh, wasn't very far. I, I could throw a rock and hit the target stand. So, so let's say 20 feet. Now we had plenty of time to aim and breathe and squeeze. We weren't like doing a quick draw and shooting from the hip. And like I said, I, I tried shooting from the hip. and. Uh, if you're fast and accurate shooting from the hip, you're a hell of a lot better shot than I am. Here's the part that amazed me. It's incredible how often under those conditions you can miss. I missed. Some people missed a lot. And nobody was trying to kill us. So what if you miss? What if you miss a lot? Now, maybe your opponent will just stand there for you indefinitely and juggle his sword. But what if your opponent is moving in, ducking and dodging and bobbing and weaving, shucking and jiving, making himself hard to hit? Serpentine, Shelly, serpentine. How many times can you miss before you run out of ammunition? Now, with a revolver, you probably got six shots if you keep around under the hammer. If you have a semi-auto with 15 in the mag and one in the pipe, great. What if your gun jams? While you're clearing your weapon, what do you think your opponent is doing? What if he's closing the distance at an all-out sprint? But what if you're really good? What if you don't miss? <laughs> yeah. In the real non-movie world, a highly motivated opponent doesn't just drop dead on the spot because he's been shot. Well, that's not impossible, but most gunshot wounds are not immediately fatal. What if your opponent is highly motivated? What if he's one of those guys who will keep on coming even with two or three bullets in him? What if, brother? What if? A wise man once said, only the dead are without fear. Fear is a survival mechanism. It's a friend trying to keep you alive. But it can be a friend like Romeo and get in the way and accidentally get his friend killed. <laughs> yeah, man, fear. Hello darkness, my old friend. Your heart is pounding. You're breathing hard. Your hair stands up on end, trying to make you look like the bigger dog. You freeze because movement attracts attention. If you don't move, maybe that tiger won't see you. 
If he doesn't see you, maybe he won't eat you. Your palms sweat and mouth is dry. You got butterflies break dancing in your stomach and your mind is racing so fast it can slow down time. You get tunnel vision. You focus on the threat and now it looks huge. Auditory exclusion, you eliminate all these distractions, see? And your limbs get really strong. The big muscles, man. You need arms and legs to run or fight. But you lose your manual dexterity. Your, your brain figures right now ain't the time to be playing the piano. And all your fine and fancy martial arts skills go right down the toilet. In a pinch, you don't rise to the level of the challenge. You sink to the level of your training. And you haven't trained for this. Now it is possible to manage fear, but it does take the right training or the right experience. Most people have never been in a life-threatening encounter with another human being. So they underestimate the fear effect because they've never felt it. Having an accident, like, like a car accident, or maybe hitting a deer, that's as close as most people ever get, and that's fine. We all like to think we're going to be Bruce Lee or Indiana Jones or Bond, James Bond. But it's a whole different scene to feel another person's intent to kill you. And even then, it isn't that easy to drop the hammer on another human being. It'll cost you. If it doesn't cost you then, it'll cost you later. If you say you can kill a person without hesitation, without compunction, and without remorse, you're either a damn liar or a damn psychopath. You go ahead and pick. Okay, let me tell you a story. This is a fencing story that my fencing master told me, and now I'll pass it on to you. Um, big tournament, big tournament, saber tournament, because this could only happen in saber. In the middle of a phrase, our hero's blade breaks, but it doesn't break out, out near the point. It breaks right here at the tank. Now, functionally, he's unarmed. But our hero gives a hearty high of silver, charges forward on the attack, and drives his opponent off the end of the strip for a penalty touch with nothing in his hand. Uh, like Luke said, sometimes nothing can be a real cool hand. See, the point is, a fighter doesn't use a weapon. A fighter is the weapon. The weapon is just an extension of the fighter's body, mind, and spirit. And a fighter doesn't rely on any weapon. A fighter relies on himself. The inferior man always goes a-looking for a bota secreta or secret weapon or a magic word, rumplesnitz. Something, anything that will enable a man who is weak, stupid, and cowardly to overcome a man who is strong and smart and valiant. I have found no evidence that such a weapon exists, has ever existed, or could exist. You see, the weapon doesn't imbue the fighter with power. It's the other way around. You dig? So I say again, don't bring a gun to a sword fight. And don't get your self-defense training from the movies. Unlike in the movies, in real life, you don't get a stunt double. And you only get one take.